Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Ashley Roach, and we're going to cover uh, introduction to Git. Uh, how many people here are, ha have used Git once? At least once, sorry. OK, good. And who feels really, really comfortable with it? Oh, OK. This might be too elementary for you, but uh, just so you know. Um, what I'm going to do in the session today is we're going to talk a bit about um, you know, what Git is, what is dis uh, distributed version control. Um, but the main thing is we want to give you guys the opportunity to sort of play along uh, to try to get some of the Git concepts under your, uh, under your fingers. So if you don't have a laptop open and, and ready, um, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, if you also, if you don't have a GitHub account, um, this isn't like an advertisement for GitHub. Uh, I work for Cisco. I'm a developer evangelist. Um, but uh, uh, the, I, we'll try to use GitHub in this process. So um, if you do have an account, then great. Go ahead and get that loaded up and logged in. If you don't, it uh, doesn't take very long to create an account. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, OK, so um, why are we here? Many of you have probably had this experience uh, when you've encountered, I don't know, maybe not just Git, but version control in general. Uh, so this is kind of a funny cartoon that says, this is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Cool. How do we use it? No idea. Just memorize these shell commands. Type them to sync up, and if you get errors, save your work somewhere else, delete the project, and download a fresh copy. <laughs> so, so hopefully, we don't want you to be in that state anymore after, uh, after this class. Um, so why would you use version control? Uh, I know many folks here are you know, more data center networking, perhaps, as opposed to application developers. And so you're wondering, perhaps, why is this relevant to me? If you start thinking about uh, the general uh, configurable uh, or co infrastructure as code concept, so with the APIs that our platforms provide or platforms in general provide, being able to store your configuration in version control becomes very, very important so that you can go back and say, oh, I, don't, I didn't realize port you know, 80 is now mapped to port 8080 in this, in this uh, configuration. You can figure out who did it, when it happened, and potentially you know, back that stuff out in a controlled way. So that's um, sort of some context for you, I think. And you might ask yourself, well, what's the difference between distributed version control and uh, regular version control or centralized? So distributed version control enables you to have um, many developers collaborate on a single project without going through that process of checking in and checking out uh, aspects of the code and locking other people out of those particular areas. So um, in a di distributed version control model, and, and, and uh, Git is sort of the, the granddaddy of that at this point, you can check out the entire repo to your workstation. That includes the history. It includes all of the code files, all of the um, chunks that are in there. Do your work. Um, do your work in a branch, typically. And then you might contribute that back so that someone can review your code changes. And what they'll do then is they'll review the changes. So in here we have um, your private machine. You might check in your code, push it up as a, in a branch, and a someone who might be having this role of like an integration manager would take that code, look at it, maybe dole it out for um, for review, and then say, "Cool, that looks good." Merge your changes, and then it goes into the main repository. So that kind of workflow can happen within an organization on the internet in general. And so, like GitHub, this is how GitHub has been very successful for open source projects. Um, because it's very easy to, to follow these processes. Um, you don't need to know this stuff really to understand Git, but it, it does help to understand some of what the funny numbers and things uh, actually, what they mean. In, in Git, this is this distributed, uh, or this uh, graph tree model that was referenced in the, the XKCD cartoon. 
But the idea is you have really just chunks of your uh, files that are changed. And those chunks are the things that get stored in your, on your file system and then up on servers. And those are like test.txt, and you'll see version 2 and new file and so on. And those are pointed to from other aspects of the graph. And then finally, what you're kind of going to most interact with are commits. And that's the sort of left, the most left-hand side in green. And those are your commits. And those numbers and letter uh, or alphanumeric strings, those are SHA hashes that are unique for each commit and cryptographically unique as well. So um, if changes were to happen on the file system, the checks in built into Git would throw errors and stuff. And so it's a, it's, it's a secure system too in that sense. Um, We'll do the actual hands-on stuff in a second, but I want to give you a bit of a preview of things that we have to do. In Git, um, because of that distributed nature, you have to be uh, identified as a when you're contributing code. And so you can't do anything with Git on your local machine unless you've configured your name <coughs> and your email address. The other thing, when we do get into workshop, uh, Julio, who raises his hand, um, he is one against all of you in terms of helping. <laughs> so um, if you need help, do raise your hand, and he can try to help you. And uh, hopefully, we can manage, manage uh, any, any problems that way. When you set up your project on your local workstation, let's say you have an existing project, this project.targz. You might expand that, put that into your project directory, but you won't have any version control at that point. In order to, to get version control just started, you have to initialize the repository. And so you can say git init. And that's that last command. Um, what happens then, though, is you just have an empty repository. And there's a file structure and folder structure underneath that hidden directory. Um, but there's nothing really in it at this point. Instead, what you have to do to import, say, that project uh, that you, you had previously, you have to actually put the, the code into the repository. But you don't go straight to commit in, in Git's uh, flows. You do one thing called adding, and that goes to this staging area before you get to uh, commit the code. And that kind of looks like this, where you, you have a staging area, your working directory. And this mirrors what you'll see in the command line as we go through. Your working directory will show things like this. You have files that are modified. There are files maybe you added that are not tracked. So it highlights that to you. When you do the git add, it will actually move those files to the staging area. And so the staging area is really useful um, so that you can double check what you're actually going to commit. And you might think, well, why would I need that? Uh, there are circumstances where maybe you have temporary files that are in your directory. Or in like if you're developing with Node, uh, there's a directory called Node Modules that's in every project where it holds all your dependencies. You might want to ignore that. And many, many times I've forgotten that I have that folder in there. Uh, I say git add star, and all of a sudden I look at uh, the, the projects and, or the files and folders that are in there. And I see, oh, darn, I've got no node modules, and it's this many files. <laughs> so I go, oh, yeah, I can add that to my ignore file. And then I back it out, and then I can commit. So it's a good safety spot. In order to commit, you use this command git commit. And the dash m gives you the um, ability to add a comment. So this is just an example comment. This doesn't actually do anything other than store those changes on your local system. So when you talk about doing collaborative sorts of uh, systems, like that initial workflow that I showed you, um, you, you have to push to a remote server in order to have your code be available over there. So this doesn't do that. You have a standalone command that does do that, and that's git push. Um, I mentioned branching earlier. Branching is a concept where you can actually Work on code that is not going to affect what would be in the main area where everyone else might be working. So typically what they recommend, uh, they, <laughs> we, uh, people who are Git practitioners or whatever, um, is to create a branch for every feature, every bug fix, all of those sorts of things so that you can work independently here. And then you do merging in order to get your code actually 
uh, available to other developers. So for a little bit of context, there's some, some terms of art here. This master name you'll see uh, coming up a bunch of times. And those are the SHA hashes uh, for commits. But basically, there's this special internal thing called head. And it gets moved around when you do these branches and checks, checkouts. So that's what that graph uh, is intended to show you. OK. So I talked about merging. Going backwards, um, some people want to know, what if I make a mistake in my commit? How do I go backwards? Uh, there's a, there are several different ways. Git revert, and you uh, apply the commit SHA hash to it. That will actually not take you back in time. But what it will do is it will take this check-in that you had that you want uh, and move that to the head of the line. So you don't actually uh, remove any history that way. You're sort of, it's a safe operation. There are, there are non-safe operations as well, um, and that's git reset. Uh, but I would use that one cautiously, I suppose. <clears throat> finally, uh, or close to finally, there, there are, is this ability to share your changes. So um, we're going to try to use GitHub in order to do that demonstration. And uh, there are two things within this. You do have to have this concept of a remote added. And so remote is, again, just an internal name. Uh, for a, sys, uh, a repository that exists somewhere else at a URI. You're going to push a name and just an alias name. In most cases, it's going to be origin. Uh, but you can add many, many uh, aliases if you need to. And then your branch name. So in this case, master. <coughs> There's an opposite direction of operation that you might want to do. And in a lot of cases, this is where you would typically start. Um, with an existing project. So you would clone the repository to your local workstation. You can do that uh, two different ways or with two different types of URIs, SSH style or HTTPS. Uh, the benefit of SSH is that you have your um, public key registered with the server. And so then you don't have to enter credentials every time you're trying to do operations. So um, again, in our case, unless you've already set that stuff up, We'll probably do HTTPS in this example. Um, but, uh, but, but regardless, just good to know that difference. Um, to be honest, most people end up using clients as opposed to running all this stuff on the command line. Uh, but it is very good to know, you know what the commands do. And sometimes it's, it's important to use the, the command line to do certain things. Um, the CLI itself is a, com a client. Uh, but there are IDE clients or integrations. So within your IDE, like uh, IntelliJ or VM or Emacs, there are certain plugins you can get. And then there are standalone Git clients like SourceTree or Git Kraken, uh, which is a very beautiful looking client, um, uh, as well as one from GitHub itself. OK. Was that reasonable fire hose of information to get started with? <laughs> Oh, question? Yeah? You need help? Who needs help? Someone? Oh, I think he might need help, not a microphone. All right. So you may like this. You may not like this. This information is special because we're doing it all together here. But it is available at the Learning Labs as well. So. Um, you might think, oh, well, this guy's just walking through Learning Labs stuff. Um, well, that's actually a good thing, because if you need a refresher after today, you can come back to the Learning Labs. You can filter on the Git tag, and you can get these three labs, Git 100, Git 101, and Git 102, and run through this stuff. So um, I would encourage you to load up the learninglabs.cisco.com, get logged in, um, and uh, find the Git 100 uh, thing. Actually, I think I have a short code or a short URL for you guys to make that easier. So bit.ly slash devnet dash git dash intro. Um, let me make that a little bigger for you. Cool. <clears throat> All right. So if you don't have a terminal up, I would recommend getting a terminal up. 
I use a kind of general directory called SRC in my workstation where I put all of my projects. Um, but the first thing we, we are going to want to do is create a directory for us to work in. Um, and so we'll call that Berlin git in this case and copy go into the Berlin git directory. So because I've been using git, my git config is actually completed. You can see the username and email here uh, is already in there. Can you guys see OK in the back, the big enough? OK, great. So let me click through here so that you guys can follow along. All right. So the two commands that you want to execute are this git config dash dash global user dot name with your name in quotes, and then subsequently dash dash global user dot name you your email address. Um, if you're wondering what global means, there can be two different configurations. You can have a per project configuration, and that's stored within the repository itself. So that'd be dash dash local. Um, or you can do the global one, so that's for every project that you might use uh, or participate in on your workstation. So has everybody done that? Who wants to play along? <laughs> if, you, if you need help, raise your hand. OK. Um, so I created a slightly different name, but you can use git intro if you'd like uh, as a directory. And within this repository, like I said before, uh, we want to initialize it. So git init. And it gives you some information back that you initialized your empty git repository right here. And what you'll see is this dot git folder. And I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like in there, just if for the, the curious people. Yeah, I mentioned the head. Uh, so you can see that file itself. Uh, I'm actually curious. I don't think I've ever looked inside of what that, what that actually has in it. So it has a pointer. Um, and this is just an internal pointer to heads, uh, refs heads master. So that's actually this in, in this folder refs. So it's just a file structure um, and can traverses all through the files um, to get you where you need to go. All right. So now that we have the, the thing created, we need to see what status it is in. So if you say git status, uh, it gives you some information. I use this a lot. So you might want to figure out, OK, is this file being tracked? Which file has changes? Um, I might want to do a diff against things. You'll see, you'll see actually what the commit names and numbers are and stuff there. So it's a very useful command. But that's kind of boring, right? We're just an empty folder <laughs> at this point. So let's add a file. Um, pick your favorite editor, whether that is Emacs or Emacs. No, no laughs? OK. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to use VI and do first.txt. So within here, uh, we're just going to add some content. And if you just follow along, um, here it is. Our best thoughts came from others. So you might notice, you know, I'm not really doing any coding here. It's just text. It doesn't have to be code that you're uh, version control, using version control for. The, um, you know, some people will do documentation primarily using Markdown, for example. And you can do that within version control. And the benefit of that is it is version controlled. So git status again, now that you've got your file. And if you remember back to that three bubble pane that we showed earlier, uh, you have untracked files, first.txt. But uh, let's try to actually commit the change. So in this case, you need to add it first. So git add, first.txt. And I'll do git status again. 
And you can see now you have a new file instead of that red untracked file. So changes to be committed and untracked files. So you can see we're kind of progressing from the red to the green, and then we'll get to, I think, blue or maybe white at the end. Um, so we can commit now. So we don't have any extraneous or er errors there. So git commit, dash m. And let's see if I had any important quote information there. Add inspirational quote. And now we have our first commit in that repository. You can see there's several pieces of information here. Add inspirational quote, right? That's our comment. You can see this uh, alphanumeric uh, set of uh, five, three, and four, seven uh, characters that are the, it's a sh abbreviated version of the SHA hash. And you'll see the long one in a second. And it gives you more information. One file changed, two insertions, and it has a create mode and the file name. So create mode, it will, Git will actually preserve, it's not 100% fidelity for um, permissions, but it will preserve permissions. So if you have a file that's executable, so like 755, it will remember that. So when the next person checks out your code, it's actually executable on their system and they won't have to run through instructions you know, to get that part working. Okay, so at this point, now we've done a file, we've added a quote, uh, maybe let's, we want to see what actually is in this project from a commit standpoint. So this is actually what the full SHA hash is for this commit. If we were to traverse into that subfolder directory that I showed you before under .git, you would actually find a folder with this SHA hash. Um, and that is how we map that tree, that distributed graph theory thing that um, isn't really super important to totally uh, know. But regardless, um, now we have our full sh short and long hash. We saw the short one on commit right here, and the long one when we did git log. If you wanted to diff, you could use two different ones, and we'll do, the, do that in a minute. OK. So let's make a change. We're going to um, add some text. Oh, we're, let's pull this whole text in. I think I might have jumped ahead in my thing. It's OK. So VI, we'll add this text. Oh, yikes. So open the file, and we'll insert and paste that information. OK, get status again. So now we've gotten from untracked to new file, and now we have modified. So cha but changes are not staged for commit. So if you remember from a few minutes ago, we talked how to stage files. And you know, thankfully, it tells you how to do it as well right here. You want to do git add and file. So git add first. And you can use wildcards and, um, and stuff there as well. But uh, git status again. Now it says changes to be committed. And we'll do git commit, bash m. And let's stay consistent here. We're going to add quote attribution. And you can use single quotes, double quotes, it doesn't matter. But if you did a double quote and then a single quote, that would, it would actually not work because it would be looking for the double quote. So if you do run into that kind of situation, uh, it's totally normal. But just you'll need to either back out that one single quote for a, a double quote or whatever. So now let's take a look. And you can see if I say git log, now we have two commits. So this 5D206FE and F4B038C, et cetera. And that corresponds to this one. <coughs> so that's great. We have two commits. Um, and we'll move on. If you noticed, there was a typo. So uh, we should fix that. So how would we see some of these changes? So go back in here first, dot txt. So we have Ralph Waldo Emerson. Okay. So in this case, we'll just 
change the change it like we would normally do it. And you can see that the change was made. And I want to show you something all el else as well. Um, I'm going to use another editor real quick because it looks like for some reason my plugin in VI isn't totally showing me all the changes the way I was expecting it to. So I'm going to use Atom. So I have, a, uh, I have an actual editor that is got a plugin that's working. And it's kind of small. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Oh, great. So a couple things to point out. And this is what's convenient about using an editor that has sort of built-in Git capabilities. You'll see this little, um, little mark right here next to the line 3 that's orange. That means this line has changed. And also that the file name itself has a special color. And that also corresponds to a changed file. If it were a new file, it would be, uh, it would be green. So let's just do one real quick. So this is how you can just visually more easily kind of track what's going on in Git sometimes. OK. So we made our change. Uh, we got to commit it. And I'm going to do git, git dash a dash m this time. So dash a means add, the add everything and commit it. So there you go. So one file changed, one insertion, one deletion. Uh, because that, f that other file was not being tracked, the one, that, the test.txt, you'll notice it wasn't committed in there along with it. So this one's still green, for example. So that's fine. We don't really want to track it anyway. But we do want to see uh, differences between two commits. So you might wonder uh, if you're coming to this project along, you know, after a few hours or maybe a few weeks, uh, what were the changes between these different commits? Uh, let's clear this out so you can see it a little better. Git log. <coughs> And in here, we have two or more um, you know, of these things. So I'm going to do a diff between these last or this first commit and the last commit. So I can copy this. And we're going to have to jump in and out. So git diff, this commit. Well, we're going to do it in a new window. Um, git log. Uh, Got to remember which commit. OK. If you do these in the, the wrong order, nothing really bad happens. It just can, can be confusing if you're doing this for real. So a diff, you, know, you might want to see that I mentioned the port 80 map was wrong or whatever. You might want to see which, what what things have changed in the file. And so there's some special um, text in this file that helps you figure that out. Um, shows you the two different things, what the version is, or what the permissions are, um, A and B. So minus, right? So minus this line. We had a new line in there that it removed. And we added these two lines. And that kind of corresponds to the same information there as well. If you were to, you can do things called patching, and it creates a diff like this to do a manual patch where you can take files, and I had to do this earlier actually today, take files and import them in, uh, or chunks and import them in based on the diff. So that's diffing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to move on to branching. And I'm going to try to combine the branching and the um, go to Git, uh, the branching and the GitHub stuff here, if I can pull it off. Because that, that's, that's the most fun part, to be honest. <laughs> OK, so branching, this is how you can navigate and make changes independent from uh, affecting the main branch. 
Some people will use this for sort of release, sort of production, staging, dev kinds of uh, environments. Uh, some people will do it, like I said, with, uh, they will still do it even in that context with version, I'm sorry, with, um, uh, <laughs> they will still do it for just doing feature branches and things like that. So let's just show you real quick what we can do with branching. So to create a branch, we say git branch, oops, and we give it the branch name. So Shakespeare is what the tutorial has you do, okay? So when we branch, you'll notice that I'm still on the master branch. So my, my terminal, I have a plugin in that that helps rewrite my, um, my bash line there to show me what branch I'm on. So to change branch, you can say git checkout uh, Shakespeare. So now I'm on the Shakespeare branch. And in here, it's the same files. This one's still untracked, which is totally fine. And we're going to make a change in the first file. So get to the first file. And we're going to add the Shakespeare quote. To be or not to be, that is the question. OK? So we'll do our normal, our normal thing, git commit dash a dash m, and we'll say add Shakespeare. Cool. So you might not believe me that this works, so I'm going to prove to you that it works. Uh, we can look at first, and we've got those quotes in there. But I can also check out the branch master. And we're going to cat that same file. So you can see this quote is no longer in the first.txt. So anyone that checks out uh, or pulls the master branch, they won't have your sort of speculative changes that you're making in the process of making. But because you might want to check them in and commit and push all along so that your work is backed up on the server and so on, but you don't want to affect those other people until you've written all your test cases and they, the test cases pass and all that good stuff, because we all write test cases, right? <laughs> um, so in any event, now I may have decided I love that quote and my, you know, my guild has decided that that quote was perfect to add to my uh, quote file here. So I'm going to merge it. The important thing to note here is that you want to be on the branch that you want to merge into. And you're essentially like pulling from the other branch and stuffing it into this branch. So git merge. And it says it used the fast forward method. Um, it took this first.txt, and there was one insertion and one file changed. If you had multiple files, uh, it would show you similar things with kind of a, a graph of what the changes looked like in each one. So let's see if the changes actually showed up here now under master. And they did. So that's awesome. All right. So that's merging and branching in a very quick way. Yes, sir. Say that again. Yes. Yes, OK. If the, it, what, what would happen if you're on the master branch, or the master branch had a change in the first.txt file? If the changes were on the same line, you would have a, what's called a merge conflict. And I'll show you what that looks like, actually. So thank you for setting, setting it up. We'll skip ahead a little bit, which is totally fine. And look at that. Next thing. You're my straight man, dealing with, with merge conflicts. OK, so there, there's a, let's go and we'll just add some information to the, uh, oh, let's go back to Shakespeare. Or no, let's do it here. First.txt, uh, we will add an attribution here. Uh, let's say 1800. I know it's different than the tutorial, but that's OK. Um, so now we have this, and we're going to commit it.
merge conflict setup. Okay, so we're gonna change back to Shakespeare, and we're gonna go open that file again. And on this same line, I can do like, you know, circa 2000, right? And I'm going to actually put one, I'm going to try something here and put one down here as well. So in order to do this, we have to go back to master. So git checkout master. Oh, I didn't commit, sorry. So git add. <laughs> it always happens, right? Uh, first, git commit. But it keeps you from screwing things up in some cases. Yeah. Git checkout, master, and we're going to say git merge Shakespeare. Ah! <laughs> so, like, the first time this happens, most people, lit like, I know I did, when I saw it, I was like, uh, okay, I got to find someone to help me. <laughs> So don't be intimidated, though, OK? You'll look, let's look real quick at what's actually in this and make, try to make some sense of it. So you'll notice a few things. Uh, down here at the bottom, test line is just fine. It's in there, OK? But up here, it gives you some information. This head has this information. And the Shakespeare branch, it has this information. The computer doesn't know how to make sense of that. Which one do you want? I don't know if 1800 is right or 2000. So what you have to do simply, and I'll just do it over here, is take, your, take the information that you want. You delete that information that's in here. Save it. And then you commit it. Oops. Fix merge conflict. So that's all you have to do is once you see that where those things are conflicted, then you just merge them in that way. OK, so how do we share this stuff? Right now, it's, all, it's still all on my, work, my local workstation. Now is when GitHub can come in. So GitHub. Now, there are many, 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 many Git servers like this. So there's GitHub. There's Atlassian Bitbucket or Atlassian Stash. I think they've renamed it all to Bitbucket. There's GitLab. There's stuff in Amazon. There's like a lot of them. GitHub is just convenient because most people uh, have access to it. Um, and it's sort of, the, its UI is kind of the gold standard what most people have gotten used to. So we're going to create a new repository. Um, and you guys, um, can do the same thing here. So under your own, under your own profile, uh, we'll do Berlin Workshop Git, and we'll do public. And I'm not going to initialize it, um, <clears throat> but you can initialize it if you're starting from scratch, for example. So create the repository. So now I've got a placeholder spot up on GitHub for my code. GitHub is also very nice because it gives you information on, OK, how do I actually, if I was starting new from, from something new, this is how I could initialize um, information and get the syncing going properly and get the remote added and all that stuff. We're going to do it a little more manually, um, but not significantly more manually. In your um, project, we need to copy these two things. Git origin, uh, git remote add origin, and then the URL to your repo. So in here. So now if I do git remote dash v, this was empty before, and now there is this alias origin, and there is a fetch and push URL as well. The, um, the next step is actually to push this information this repository to GitHub. So we can say git push dash u will update and origin master. Ah, so I did the HTTPS version. Um, so this is actually a good little lesson, but we're going to skip it for now. Um, 
the, uh, well, I can fix that pretty easily. So I'll show you an example where you can add another remote. Oh, get remote add. So now if I do git remote dash v, I have two. So I was saying you could push depending on which one you want. So git push uh, dash u origin, not origin, git ssh master. Cool. So there's a new branch available on GitHub. So if you refresh this page, you can see I have first.txt. <coughs> so for those of you that want to play along, we've got five more minutes. Very good. Uh, can you navigate to this URL? So github.com slash aroach slash berlin dash workshop dash git. If you do, I want you to, I want you to notice something here. These three buttons up here in the right-hand corner. Click on fork when you get there. And hopefully at least one person will do it so that I can complete my demo. No pressure, one person. <laughs> so if I fork this, or if you fork it, what it will do is it will make a clone, or it will copy this, my project, and it will make it available where a place I can make writes. And so what we're going to end up doing is you, I want you to make a change in first. And you can make it just here within the UI. You can click Edit, add another line, um, and then s do a commit at the bottom. And actually, when you do that, choose this. Create a new branch and start a pull request. And so what that'll do is that will actually notify, notify me uh, on my repo that, that you've made a change and that you want to actually submit it back to me. So let me see if I can demo this uh, if no one's going to do it. Anybody doing it? Yeah, one person? I got to keep refreshing. I don't see any pull requests. I see forks. That's awesome. No pressure, guys. Two minutes. We can go a little longer, said Paul. Right? OK. Are we waiting in vain? Are we OK? Even, even if we don't, I can show you what this actually means. OK. I'm going to move on, because I'm not sure if anybody's got it. Let me show you a couple things. These are useful for you to know anyway. Um, so I showed you the Learning Labs. We have the Learning Labs as a resource where you can come back and experiment with this stuff. There's also a site that um, like my colleague Hank and I and others um, have been working on for doing training for internal SEs, and we've done it some for partners as well. There are a set of modules in here, one of them advanced Git. And so you can follow this uh, lesson as well. There's slides that are generated from the README. Um, and it'll give you a lot of the same information, but it has some slightly different exercises. So that's some good resource for you to, um, to be aware of. But what, um, what I wanted to show you was that um, I actually forked this particular one when I was working on it. And so we can probably navigate to it. Uh, i got to remember where I forked it, though. I think I forked it in my GitHub, uh, Cisco DevNet GitHub. Cisco DevNet. Uh, I forked a different one, but it's, it's OK. So you see, this was forked from IMAPEX Training REST API Swagger. So this is another project, which if you're interested in learning about microservices and containerizing uh, a REST API, uh, you might be interested in checking it out. Um, but basically, when I forked it um, and uh, I submit pull requests back to the other direction, uh, there are pull requests that show up uh, as closed. And these are 
For example, Julio had made some edits. He submitted them to me. Um, I approved them, and then they got merged. And so that way you can, you can actually move your code around in a nice, safe way without, um, you know, with experimentation on your side and then getting some approval process so another person that's familiar with the code base can go and check. So, um, and this can work on github.com if, if they, there are enterprise versions of uh, Git servers like the um, Atlassian's Bitbucket and GitHub has an enterprise version. They all follow the same paradigm of forking pull requests, and so on. So um, the other thing is there are some really nice resources out there. Um, Atlassian actually has some great uh, information about comparing Git workflows. So there's different styles of how you can do workflows within your development organization or you know, IT operations, or uh, if you want to do that stuff that we say you should, should be doing that, infrastructure as code. Um, if you want to stay in touch with me, these slides will be available. Um, I believe they're maybe already available uh, on the schedule. So you can refer to them, hit me up with any questions, or um, you know, follow us on Twitter and that kind of thing, too. I hope that everyone learned at least one thing, um, maybe two. And um, you know, all feedback is great. We have uh, session evaluations that you can do. I think you win a t-shirt. Um, and uh, so on. So thanks again for your attention um, and enjoy your time here uh, in Berlin at the DevNet Zone uh, and take care.